Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Patrick Schmidt, Editor-in-Chief of The Drinks Business, and I'm delighted to welcome you into the world of wines from the Paydock, from the comfort of your living room, garden shed, or I don't know, wherever you have Wi-Fi. Um, now, the format for this masterclass is going to be that we'll, the whole thing will last, I hope, uh, no more than an hour. Um, certainly the last masterclass didn't. And at the end, we're going to have some time for um, questions and answers. So do put them in the, uh, in the Q&A function and I shall address them at the end of the masterclass. Um, this is our second masterclass on the wines of the Paydock. Uh, the last one looked at varietal and commercial wines, or that was the, the heading of the event. It was really focused on those wines from the region that were made with famous international grapes and really directed at the mainstream wine market. Um, this masterclass covers some of that ground. Uh, we will be looking at mainstream grapes. We are looking at affordable wines. All the wines in the following uh, in this masterclass are, are, are below ten pounds UK retail, aside from one. Um, but the focus of today's masterclass is organic wines. These are all made with certified organic grapes. Um, now, before we look at these wines, which we will do in detail, you have plenty of time to taste. But just hold off. Uh, pouring or drinking the wines at the moment. I mean, obviously you can do what you like, but it'd be nice if we taste them together. Um, before we do that, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the region and just give you a bit of a sense um, as to why I think this part of France is so relevant for you as buyers and for the, uh, the wine drinker today, particularly in the UK. Um, and so I've begun that by asking myself the question on your behalf, why the pay doc? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we need to think about is today's trends amongst wine drinkers. I think people are looking for things that are well known. I mean, nothing's changed there, but seeking comfort in great varieties they recognise. Um, they're looking for things that are authentic. It, you know, it doesn't take much time on the internet to find out whether something has a genu genuine story, uh, whether it's made from a great variety that's native, whether it's from a domain that is historic. Um, whether it's generally can be traced to one particular site or place. Uh, and then people want things that are affordable. I don't want to talk too much about the current crisis uh, or the recession that's, that's being caused as a result of it, if, if not a depression. But where, whatever the era is, people want things that are affordable. It's a very small part of the market that really drinks wines above £10, as all of you know. Um, so what part of the world can deliver things that is the wines that are affordable, that are authentic, that are made with well-known grapes, um, and the pay dock is a natural place to look to. Um, it's an enormous part of, of France. It's a, it's a viticultural haven for winemakers. It's a kind of playground because there's so much freedom with the pay dock classification, and we'll look at why that is shortly. Um, the other thing, and really what I want to emphasise in this, the second of three masterclasses, um, is the idea that the pay dock is a brilliant place for sourcing organic wines uh, or sustainable wines, those where the green credentials are very strong. I mean, we do have wineries down here that, you know, uh, uh, made uh, the, where the wines are made with renewable energy, they're carbon neutral wineries, but really the focus is about organics today. Um, and the reason is it's a, it's a very windy part of France and it's very dry. Perpignan down the south of France is the driest city uh, in the nation along with, uh, with the north plate cities like uh, Colmar and, and Alsace. But basically this area of France is very dry which is vital for producing very clean organically grown grapes with a few inputs as I'm sure you all know. Um, the other thing is, is, is trying to find keenly priced alternatives to the famous wines of France. That's something I quite often find with buyers. They're used to sourcing Chardonnay from Burgundy, Merlot from Saint-Emilion, or Sauvignon from Sancerre. And because those are controlled areas with finite supplies, the prices of grapes and wine are gradually edging upwards and once you start getting over £10 you basically quite often alienate a lot of buyers for whom that's a psychological barrier. So where do you go? Well the pay dock provides affordable alternatives uh, and wines with personality and quality and that's what we're going to look at plus with the added benefit here of being organic. Um, 
I mean, there's very little else to really say at this stage. So that's really the background to this. Uh, the one other thing I would say is that uh, this is the plan for today's masterclass, but the wines that you're looking at or going to be looking at shortly, uh, which I hope have all arrived, um, are the distillation of a much larger tasting I did. When I was asked to present these wines or present wines from the pay doc uh, to an audience, um, now sadly online because of the coronavirus, although actually I think there are many benefits to draw from the fact that you're all on Zoom because we can reach a wide audience and you can enjoy these wines afterwards in the comfort of, of, your, of your own homes over dinner or whatever. Um, but when I was asked to do this masterclass, um, they wanted me to make a selection of wines to present. And I said, I think the best way to do that is for you to approach all the producers in the region and say, I will taste test the wines that you submit to me, but blind. And from that, I will draw up a selection. And that's what happened. So I had about 300 wines sent to me. Uh, then that was in my uh, in our, the drinks business offices in Southwark. And over the course of a week in batches, whether they were whites, rosés, you know, different types of wines, I taste them completely blind. And when I say completely blind, obviously I knew the colour, but I knew nothing else. I didn't know the grape varieties. And I wanted to do that very deliberately because I didn't want to default to um, writing tasting notes on, on what I knew if I saw it was a Chardonnay or a Viognier or a Pinot Noir, I'd write what I thought. I wanted to do it completely blind. Each of those wines, I wrote a detailed note and I scored. And at the end of it, I produced a selection of the wines I thought were greatest according to the themes. So the wines we're looking at today were, um, were drawn from all the wines that I thought were good, that I knew later were organically certified. And also to obviously provide a selection. I didn't want to show you, I don't know, eight Chardonnays that were organic. Obviously, they need to, to show a different uh, a range of styles. So that's the basis of the tasting today. Now, the strengths... Um, of the region I'm going to look at in turn before we go to the tasting. Very briefly before we even look at those strengths, the history of the pay doc. I think it's important to stress that the pay doc is actually quite a recent uh, classification. Uh, 18, 1987 was the first use of the term pay doc uh, by Robert Scarly, a producer down in this part of, of France. Uh, he had a winer in California. Uh, he was seeing the march of variety la varietally labelled wines onto the supermarket shelves of France and elsewhere. And he thought, well, look, the French need to play at this game. We need to start uh, producing wines that are varietally labelled and use the famous grapes of France on those labels, the likes of Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so really from the 80s onwards, um, not only did he start under his brand Fortin de France, uh, labelling wines uh, with famous grape varieties. He used the term pay doc on them to represent this part of France. There was a pay doc producers union um, and he also encouraged growers to start planting those famous international grapes in pay doc soil. Um, Fortin de France, the first bottles with pay doc on the label in 87, there were 80,000 bottles that were released. Uh, today we have about 800 million that are made annually. So there has been a step change in production. But I think what that also says uh, was that Robert Scarly and Fortin de France and his vision were very much on trend. Uh, they have been proven to be successful. And without it, one wonders where the pay, pay doc would be today. 2009, it became a PGI, which is important because it meant that it's officially classified and all the wines that come out of the pay doc today have to be sampled for quality, uh, independently assessed, so that really no faulty wines should leave the region with pay doc on the label and make their way into the market. And I think that's important too. Uh, that's a little bit about PDIs versus PDOs. So strengths. Now, the first thing I would say about the pay doc when I was to really earmark the key strengths is scale. This is a massive region. And I think that's really important for you as buyers to be aware of. There's so much to choose from. There's a lot of wine made. This is how they reach economies of scale, how they reach those affordable uh, price points. It's not a hugely expensive place to make wine. Uh, and there's a lot to choose from. 
Uh, and with scale comes diversity, which we'll look at next. But just to put that in context, so we've got 120,000 hectares of pay dot classified uh, wine producing vineyards, but that's from the larger region of the Languedoc Roussillon, which is 240,000. So they're drawing from a large area. The rest of that wine obviously will be coming under um, uh, those famous regions of, of the Languedoc, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, Côte de Roussillon or the regions such as Minervois, Corbière, you, you, you would know them, but, um, but those, are, those are PGIs rather than the IGP of Paydoc. Uh, we're looking at over 800 million bottles produced annually. And just to put that in context, you know, um, this region, Paydoc, is 10 times bigger than Burgundy. Uh, and it also represents 10% of the entire French vineyard area. So you can look at some of these stats on my PowerPoint that I've pulled together. I think New Zealand is a good comparison. Um, obviously a very successful wine producing country in the UK market and really cornered um, the market for Sauvignon Blanc with Marlborough. Well, Marlborough is 23,000 hectares. Um, so, and, and, and New Zealand as a whole produces a total of 300 million litres of wine. So it's a lot smaller than just the pay dock. So this really is a large region. 48% of production is red, so uh, a little under half is red wine, then you've got rosé and white. Rosé is important. Do bear in mind pink wines. Uh, the pay dock rosé uh, production is bigger than all of Côte de Provence. And bear in mind how successful Provence our rosé is at the moment, but also the limits on supply. And then we've got a thousand independent producers, so a lot of people to call upon uh, when you're searching for your ideal supplier. Another strength, image. This part of southern France just has such a strong image. Okay, so it's not the Côte de Provence on the label, um, but you know a lot of the imagery is similar. 200 kilometers of, of, of beaches along the Mediterranean, the fortified town of Carcassonne, um, the rocky outcrops, the mountainous region, region the Cathar castles. Um, it's just a completely stunning part of France uh, with so much positive imagery to draw upon, the kind of joie de vivre of um, this part of southern France. So you've got a very strong associations in terms of image to draw upon. And you can look at the wine labels here. I mean, a lot of very good packaging design um, that draw upon the kind of sunny, fresh imagery of this, this part of the world. And there's a quote there that I've put in from Jacques Gravejal, who's president of the Paydoc Wine Producers Union and was in the, uh, in the 80s when uh, Robert Scarly launched that Fortin de France brand and he really conjures up what's so wonderful about the region, talking about how the vines plunge into the uh, Mediterranean Sea and they go up the mountains. Okay, location. I think it's always important to have a map with these masterclasses. Don't worry for those people who feel that they know the pay doc inside out. I'm not going to uh, talk for a long period um, about the background of this region, but I think it's important to start with a map just so where you can see here where it is. Uh, it extends from Provence to the Pyrenees and the border with Spain. The capital of the region is Montpellier. And I think this is also important. There's a map from, um, from winefolly.com that I, I took off the other morning, uh, just really to compare where the Languedoc Roussillon, which is the basis of the pay dot classification, where it is relative to other parts of France, other famous wine regions. So you will see Atlantic, Southwest French, Bordeaux grapes in the Languedoc Roussillon planted extensively, the likes of Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Malbec. And as you can see there, you know, this part of, uh, of the Languedoc Roussillon is not a million miles from southwest France. There is, in fact, in the western Languedoc some Atlantic influence. But then also to the east, along the coast, you've got Provence. Uh, so obviously, as I mentioned earlier, rosé, uh, Provençal look-alike rosés really are, are quite common and the grapes of Provence are, are prevalent in the Languedoc Roussillon. And then of course you've got the Spanish border uh, right there to the south and a strong Spanish influence in this part of France that was in fact uh, came under the crown of Aragon for you know several centuries. So historically a lot of Tempranillo and, and, and Garnacha and, and Carignan, Carignania grown in this part of France. And then of course the Rhone to the north and hence uh, still to this day a lot of Syrah and Viognier planted. Um, 
Diversity, I mentioned earlier, with scale comes diversity. A lot of different soil types, a lot of different climates, a lot of different influences. Um, I think that's very important. I mentioned soil types briefly. We will see different soil types, and I've, I've tried to include with each one of these wines the, the base, the subsoil, uh, because I think that's relevant to the style of wine produced. Um, but you know, you have sand, you have limestone, you have limestone clay, miles. Um, you also have these pebble terraces, uh, the galets that are famous in Chateau Neuf du Pape. You can find those too in this part of France, um, but just n it's not as famous as, as, as they are in, in Chateau Neuf. <clears throat> and diversity as well coming with topography, a strong influence of the mountains, this part of France, the Massive Centrale, the foothills of the Cévennes, and then the Pyrenees down to the south. So uh, mountains are very important, not just for the altitudinal effects, uh, but also the cooling winds that they produce. Um, and I think actually wind is something I want to stress here, because I find with tasting the wines of this part of France, that with the kind of image that you have of beautiful sun-baked summers and holidaying Brits down here, um, that the wines don't taste to me like very excessively hot climate wines. We're not tasting baked fruit. The alcohols are not excessively high. There are a lot of very fresh whites made here. And part of that comes with the altitudinal effect of higher altitude vineyards, but a lot of it comes to this effect of the winds. There are four winds that buffet this part of France, and I've listed it there. But you know, there's the maritime influence, there are winds from the Atlantic, there are winds from the Mediterranean, and then there are these co cold winds that come down from mountain ranges uh, that I've mentioned already. So I think they bring an important balance to the wine. They're also very relevant to this masterclass because um, exposure and winds are very important for circulation and that reduces disease incidence in the grapes and that makes it a very good place for low intervention viticulture and of course it makes it easier to produce wines organically. Um, and I think that's really it. Authenticity, I think it's also actually something that I didn't fully appreciate until I, I was doing a bit more research. I do know the Paydoc fairly well as a region. I've visited it many times. Um, but I didn't fully appreciate that actually the vine arrived in France uh, near the town of Narbonne, which is within the languedoc roussillon region, or within the Languedoc. So that means that the oldest vineyards in France come within this part, this area, where the Paydot wines are sourced from. So, you know, if you're looking for authenticity, these are the oldest vineyards in France. Um, it was really the Romans, not the Greeks, that developed winemaking on a bigger scale, and I've mentioned that actually uh, it's a, big, a strong Spanish influence in the area, and a lot of the widely planted grapes in this part of France were um, of Spanish origin, so uh, Garnacha, uh, Carignana, and Sensibel, which uh, is the Spanish synonym uh, for temp uh, is the French synonym rather for Tempranillo, uh, which is actually there's not much of it really plants the Languedoc today, but it's worth bearing in mind and looking out for it. Um, then it was really in the the birth period in the 70s and 80s of the Paydoc classification when the international grapes started to gain favour and people really were encouraged to plant them because of the commercial importance. You know, you may look at the fact that, that Merlot's widely planted the Languedoc today and think it's a bit odd. Well, Merlot is still one of the best-selling grapes in the world. And then it was in, in ascendancy. It was what people wanted to drink, so it's what was planted down here in the Paydoc. Uh, a lot of Chardonnay, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, and increasingly Pinot Noir today, because again, Pinot Noir is a grape in the ascendancy. Quality control, I also think it's worth mentioning, I did uh, earlier with uh, Paydoc being an IGP, uh, there is an element, well, there's very important, there's full traceability for the wines and there's quality assessments. Uh, so all bottles of Paydoc IGP are certified by Bureau Veritas before they're released onto the market. Um, so every commercial uh, sample is taste tested and I think that's important to know. So I suppose you have a certain security, a guarantee with the uh, IGP Paydoc label that you won't have um, a poor or faulty wine. Varietal wines, this is really important as well. I've kind of mentioned it in past, passing a number of times, but they are key um, to the Paydoc offer. 
you know, variety labelled whites, Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc, and reds, Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet. Um, you'll see a lot of them, but that's really important. It makes this area commercially extremely significant. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of freedom for the winemakers because they're allowed to play with as many as 58 different grape varieties. And they keep adding more. You know, it's not a closed shop. It's one of those places where if someone wants to try something um, and it works, it produces good wine, they're quickly allowed. So you'll see now, and we had it in the last masterclass, um, a Paydoc Alberino, for instance, uh, and they're newcomers all the time. Um, 92% of all French varietal wine comes from the Paydoc, so this really is the go-to for that particular type of wine. Um, other newcomers, sometimes there's some crosses in there as well. Uh, Carmenere and Sangiovese have recently been added to the list. Um, this may not surprise you, it slightly surprised me. Merlot is the most planted grape in this part of France. Uh, Pinot Noir is the fourth most, so if you think Pinot was only really for the, for the slopes of the Côte d'Or in Burgundy or, or parts of Alsace, um, actually there's, there's a lot of Pinot Noir down in the Pay Dock, and that's great because with prices of Pinot going up in more famous parts of uh, Pinot growing, producing parts of France, um, this is a place to look to if you're trying to hit lower price points with Pinot Noir, which we know is, or, or rather, I'm assuming you know, is very much a grape on trend at the moment. Marceline, that's a cross, Grenache Cabernet, we're not looking at any today, but worth bearing it in mind. Um, a grape that's rising in ascendancy from this part of France, also a lot of it being planted in China, disease resistant, uh, one of those hybrids that's worth bearing in mind uh, when it comes to sustainable winemaking and in extreme, extreme climates. Blends are on the rise a bit here, having really bigged up uh, variety labelled wines. Uh, they're about 7% of output today, they were 2%. We're going to look at some dual varietal blends here today. Uh, but actually, you know, blended wines are a strength of the pay dock and worth bearing in mind. Don't feel you always have to be uh, focused on just single varietal wines. Uh, the Mediterranean grapes on the increase here, Grenache, Morverd, Sanso, they thrive in the natural conditions here. Um, but you know, so do a lot of the international grapes we're looking for. We're going to be looking at. They produce very successful uh, results here. And um, Carignan, worth bearing in mind, a grape on the rise. Uh, there's a Carignan Renaissance group. Um, but you know, this part of France does produce very good Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so don't forget um, that in the search for Cabernets from beyond Bordeaux or anywhere else in the world perhaps be it Chile or Tuscany or, or even California. And this shows you a little bit, uh, just um, a bar graph of, of, of how much um, of some of those famous grapes are planted in the Languedoc. So actually 60% of France's Syrah comes from this part of France, 45% uh, of Grenache, 25% of Merlot, and then I think, you know, further down those interest, more than 10% of all of France's Pinot Noir comes from the Languedoc, and almost a third of all of um, French Chardonnay is from this part of France. Um, so there's a lot, a, a lot of volume of production made with famous uh, demanded uh, French um, noble grape varieties. And this shows a little bit of the production of paid doc rather than just Languedoc, um, by type, by colour type. So, I mean, I would just look at the top three in each of those case, cases. So, reds, Merlot, Cabernet, and Syrah. And then rosés, those classic Provençal grapes that produce such fine, delicate, dry rosés of, of Grenache, Sanso, and Syrah. And then in whites, you've got Chardonnay there at the top, Sauvignon, and Viognier. And don't forget Viognier. People maybe don't see it commercially as, as quite as... Uh, important as, as things like Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, but it produces beautiful wines in this part of France and it's fantastic at giving a bit of stuffing, a bit of sort of ripe peachy richness and personality uh, to blends as well. Um, and we're going to look at a very fine barrel fermented Viognier shortly, which I was very excited to find. Uh, I said a little bit about the strength I find from that blind tasting I did recently in visiting the region over a number of uh, years. In terms of 
pure quality and character rather than commercial um, potential really, I found that the Viognier, the Grenache Gris and Blanc in the whites have been excellent and also Vermentino, uh, classic Mediterranean grape, also called Roll in this part of France and particularly in Provence, produces lovely white wines. Reds and rosés, very good um, basis for those is Grenache and Syrah and also very good Cabernet um, and that includes Cabernet based rosés. Um, but at the fine wine end of the scale, uh, some of the Cabernet-based reds are first class. Um, and so here, um, as I've said, you know, we've got third of France's Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, 25% of France's Merlot, and as much as 60% of the Syrah. Now, the final aspect to this introduction that I really want to stress today is um, the region's um, affinity for making organic wines. Um, and I've really said why that is. It's, it's windy, it's dry, um, and also there's an ethos of, of low intervention and low input, input um, viticulture. And you know, part of that is to do with costs. You know, this is, a, this is an area where um, there's not necessarily high cost winemaking. You know, it's not like the, uh, the horse-drawn uh, plows of the smart sites in Burgundy or Bordeaux where very high value wines are produced. This is low input, low intervention, because that's an inexpensive way to make and grow vines in this area where they don't need a lot of inputs. You know, it's naturally fairly easy to make organic wines. And therefore, you know, I urge people down there to really embrace organics um, and buyers to seek out organics. And, and I think one of the things that's very exciting about the pay docs is being able to find a good organic affordable wine because of course there is an issue I think with organics that either people think that cheap organic wine is a bit rustic um, and maybe they're even suspicious of it which they shouldn't be from here because it's good when it's affordable or that to find great organic wine you have to pay through the nose well here you don't now I've put a few things in there. One of the reasons these masterclasses are, are focused really on the commercial end of the, of the wine market um, is that organic is very, very important today commercially. This is a growth area. I've put there a rep uh, some numbers from a Soil Association report for 2020 uh, for the UK market in retail showing that organic wine uh, was growing at 45%. Now that's off a relatively small base, but don't forget this is in a market that is not in growth. The wine market in the UK is, is really is, is plateaued at best. Um, so this is an important growth area and therefore it's stealing share from other parts of the market. So you really want to look closely at the organic sector and obviously they need to be certified organic um, to be able to really flag that up to consumers. Um, at the moment, around 700 million bottles of organic wine are produced and sold, consumed annually. Um, but that is projected to reach a billion bottles by 2023, so it's a growth market. This is global production and demand. And to put that in perspective, if the uh, worldwide market for wine is about 30 billion bottles, maybe a bit lower than that, then you're looking at a, a, a market share of about 3.5% for organic wines globally by 2023, which sounds small, but is not insignificant. This is a big sector of the market. Um, and as I said, for it to grow, we've got to find affordable, good quality organic wines. And for that, I would suggest considering the pay doc, and we're gonna look at that shortly and see what you think of these wines. So, the tasting. Now onto the tasting. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. I hope you're not thinking, God, when's he going to get on with serving us the damn wines? Because that is coming now. Um, and I just want to say that with these wines, when I selected them, or when I tasted them, uh, it was blind. I didn't know what wines were organic or what grapes were I was tasting. I didn't know anything about them, as I said at the beginning. So these wines were all wines that I chose because I thought they were good. I didn't choose them if they were organic. And then when I looked basically at the selection I'd made of maybe about 50 wines out of that 300 that I thought were really lovely, and then narrowed it down to about 25 
where I'd given all the wines, I think it was 88 or 89 points and above. And then I looked through those and I looked at the producer's notes and I found out which ones were organic. And then from those organic uh, wines that I'd already decided were good, I made this selection. Um, so that was how I arrived at this choice. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping that the wines are, are good representations of the region, good representations of the grape variety teas that are used to make them and a good I suppose poster for organic wine you know they should promote the qualities of organically grown wines at this affordable end of the scale okay so uh, with that said uh, wine one now this is probably the most delicate of the wines that you're going to see today I'm clutching my my bright red spittoon here a party cup um, and I'm going to taste it with you as we go along here. Um, the wines in this room are quite cold, uh, but I'm hoping it's showing well. Uh, this is Domaine saint cell It's a Colombard Vermentino blend, 50-50, uh, makes it nice and simple. And it's grown in limestone soils. And the producer is based in saint chinian uh, so a region famous for its reds. And here, uh, working with these whites, it's chosen for the paydock status, uh, so it can produce a varietally labelled wine um, and it doesn't have to stick to the strictures of a Saint-Chinian appellation, which wouldn't allow uh, this type of wine to be produced and labelled Saint-Chinian. Mm. Now, as I said, I had that blind. What I like about this wine, um, whether or not it's organic, and that's a bonus, these all start from the basis of being good value, good wines, um, is it's got a real freshness. It's really lively. Uh, it's got a certain amount of juiciness. It's not thin, but it really highlights for me that this part of France is able to craft right but really refreshing wines. Um, and I also, I want to put a bit of a spotlight on... Uh, Vermentino. This is a blend of Colombard and Vermentino. Colombard, a grape variety better known for use in Gascony in southwest France, where it's the basis for making uh, neutral wines for um, distilling to make cognac. Um, but Colombard produces quite delicate, relatively inert, slightly kind of Sauvignon-like um, fresh white wines. But here it's blended with Vermentino and Vermentino produces, I think, quite a range of styles, depending on how it's handled, where it's grown. But a real advantage of Vermentino is that it produces wines with a lot of freshness, almost like a sort of pink grapefruit uh, brightness, even in very warm climates. Um, it can bring some sort of peachy ripeness as well, which I really like. Um, and it's, it's naturally suited to this climate. It is a classic Mediterranean grape, famous for being widely grown in Sardinia, uh, famous for, for being less famous but widely grown too in Corsica which is nearby uh, along the Tuscan coast uh, and I think DNA profiling has, has meant that its origins are kind of around Liguria, Sancterre region, uh, Piedmont but it's, it's classically uh, typically grown uh, in the Med and it likes sort of maritime influence, coastal areas, uh, hot summers and produces very fresh styles of wine. So there's an example of a fresh, bright, I think squeaky clean, organic white wine at a good price um, that I suppose is, I don't want to knock Pinot Grigio, why would I? But if you're thinking it kind of a comparison, it's a bit more characterful perhaps um, than a kind of northern Italian Pinot Grigio and, uh, and is affordable and bright and maybe doesn't have the kind of herbaceous um, pungency of um, a Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc um, but a lot of freshness I think it's a lovely wine okay so the second having talked about Sauvignon Blanc um, here's a wine that I think has uh, it ticks as two boxes uh, or three really uh, the two I'm thinking of initially are the fact that it's organic 
and it really is on trend commercially because it's made with Sauvignon Blanc, which along with Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay is the most demanded grape in the UK market. Um, the third box I would say is that it looks quite funky, it's quite fun. This striking packaging um, with this wolf on it, Domaine La Louvière, the Domain of the Wolves. Um, named after a site in the Pyrenean foothills where wolves used to kind of gather and look down on the valley below. And Le Libertin, the Libertine, it's a kind of uh, rule-breaking uh, white wine. Um, and I think, yeah, the reason why they've given it this, I mean, it's a fun label, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very striking, but the idea of Le, Le Libertin, that it's kind of breaking the rules, um, actually, Domaine La Louvière is from a, a part of the western Languedoc called Malpère. And being in the west, there is actually some Atlantic influence. It's near southwest French vineyards like Cahors, not a million miles from Bordeaux, Bergerac. Um, and in fact, Malpère, as a result, uh, they allow, in fact, the region, the, the rules, the guidelines stipulates that you must use those Atlantic um, Southwest French grapes, the, the classic ones from the Cabernet family, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, um, Malbec. Um, and here we are, um, the white Atlantic influence grape of Sauvignon Blanc um, planted and grown here, um, not allowed under the Malpair um, appellation, so a, a pay doc. And I think it performs brilliantly. Um, and I, I, it really struck me when I tasted it blind uh, because I thought it was very pungent. It was very much the style of Sauvignon Blanc that I think does well in the competitions um, and that people like. Um, I think I better taste it now before I talk anymore and check that I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking the same things I, I thought when I tasted this a few weeks ago. Mm. Yeah, it's so clearly, wonderfully, instantly identifiable as Sauvignon Blanc some of that kind of, I don't know, almost like a slight note of capsicum, you know, green bell pepper. So it's got some of those green pungency, but also on the palate, it's got some black currant and black currant leaf, a touch of passion fruits, and then that really bright sort of zesty uh, grapefruit lime zest finish. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a very good, um, very clearly identifiable Sauvignon, maybe with a slightly ripe textured core to it uh, and then a fresh slightly nettly finish um, very good and then with the bonus of being organic um, you know if, if someone's in the market for um, organic Sauvignon Blanc um, it's quite hard to find really good inexpensive examples um, very little organic wine production in Marlborough for example the Loire more so but that would a lot of that would be under the famous appellations such as Sancerre and Puy Fumé and it'd be a lot pricier um, something else about this, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it looks very striking, it's got this kind of funky appearance. Um, I noticed that the general manager of Domaine La Louvière is, is, is an Aussie and it's said that there's a kind of, you know, nod to the new world with the way these wines are made and packaged. Um, and I think that's a good thing really um, for giving, ensuring that this performs well. Okay. Uh, the third wine and the penultimate of the whites. Um, if you haven't heard of Domaine Gaeda, um, this is one I think that you know is important to, to remember, or rather, is one that you'll see in fact again in this tasting. I did really want to share the love when I selected these wines, so I didn't want to do more than one wine across these three masterclasses from um, any one producer. But when it came to this organic masterclass, I couldn't help having two in. Um, and I'll, you'll see at the end why. But the reason why Domaine Gaeda is, is, is in here twice is because I think they do a really good job at producing affordable, clean, um, well-packaged organic wines um, and they as a result are successful um, and it just happened that when tasting as I said blind uh, two really really strong contenders um, in my tasting uh, one white one red came from the same domain but let's focus here on this one um, it's a white it's made from Grenache Blanc and Viognier uh, those are two grapes that I think perform very well in this part of France. Uh, they're both uh, grapes that tend to give quite a full-bodied style of wine. I don't feel this wine is too fat or lacking in freshness. 
Um, but um, I think it's important, the name, Flying Solo, um, they've got this idea that, that the Flying Solo brand is used because it kind of flies in the face of convention. Well, the reason why this wine flies in the face of convention is actually because it's using what are native French grapes um, of this part of France. Um, traditionally, Grenache, Grenache Blanc, Viognier coming from, from this part of, of, of the Mediterranean. Um, whereas Pay Doc would more traditionally, in fact, be using those international grapes, Chardonnay, Cabernet, etc., Sauvignon Blanc, um, from further north and west of France. So that's why it's unconventional. Um, and the uh, kind of stamp and the, and the uh, biplane in the background there is uh, celebrating the aeropostal pilots that used to deliver letters down to this part of France in the 20s and risk their lives doing so. So that's the kind of story behind the label. Um, let's taste the wine. Mm. Yeah, it does, um, it's interesting because it is quite broad and it has some of the kind of peachy richness, almost like dried apricot character of Viognier and slightly floral, but it's not kind of sickly and rich. Uh, it still has a lot of freshness. I think it's a very clean wine. It's very easy drinking. Um, it's got a lovely long finish. Um, and I think it's pretty and it's easy, but it's got a lot of personality. You know, it's not a look-alike. It's not a, another, you know, Chardonnay that tastes like a, a Macon. Um, it's, it, it's its own rind. It's, it's not a, a replica, um, but it's very well made. It's affordable, it's organic. Um, it's very pleasant to drink. I think it's worth saying a couple of other things about Domaine Gaeda. Um, it's uh, started by a guy called Tim Ford, uh, and I think he's, he's been making wine down there for almost 20 years. But the winemaking consultant is um, a chap called uh, Mark Kent from Birkenhurtskloof in South Africa. And he's the producer of quite a, a popular and, 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 and well-established wine in the UK market called The Chocolate Block. Um, and he's a talented winemaker, but why would he have a a consultant winemaker from South Africa. Well, Tim Ford, who started Domain Gator, used to be, um, uh, he was trained in horticulture. He used to be a cut flower grower and exporter uh, from Africa um, and based in South Africa, but he had a business in Zimbabwe. And the whole, the farm, everything he had was uh, seized by the uh, Zimbabwean government in 2002 under Mugabe. So he had all his, his business, his farm um, taken from him um, at the start of this century and in his 40s had to start again and he'd always dreamed of being a winemaker. His parents had vines on the childhood farm in Kent and um, so he started at age 43 I think down in uh, with Domaine Gaeda and with this South African winemaking influence. Um, and it's been a successful project, but I think, you know, if you read about it, he's, he's struggled to make it work, struggled. It's been a lot of work, as it always is, with a wine property. Okay, the fourth wine. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, right, this wine, I was really excited by this wine. I hope you agree with me. Um, maybe we should taste it first, rather than me talking endlessly about the wine um, and leaving you wondering what it's like. Let's taste it. Um, the reason why I wanted you to taste it first is because it is quite an assault on the senses. You know, you can imagine a blind tasting uh, with a lot of quite delicate white wines. Uh, this would really stand out. Um, and it stood out for me for, in, a, in a really good way. I was really excited to find this and all the more uh, pleased when I found out more about it because it really is a niche wine with no representation in the, in the UK at all uh, and a lovely story. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a pure Viognier. It's from a producer called Domaine Coste Rouge and it's called L'Esperance Blanc. It's 100% Viognier. It's barrel fermented and matured. Now it does show, particularly on the nose, when you first nose it, a lot of oak. Um, now some people might say that's a bit dominant. Uh, some people might really like it. I do like it. But what I would say 
is that um, this is a wine that's got a lot of weight. It's still showing quite a lot of that 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 barrel influence, but hold it, hold on to it, and have it later tonight with whatever you're eating, and see how it opens up in the glass and how it complementary it is with really any type of food. It's such a versatile wine, um, and the oak really to me settles into the background as soon as you start eating with this wine. It's a fantastic food wine, um, but it's a, to me it's a, it's a very exciting one. It's actually. You are seeing a lot of barrel influence here, but it's kind of almost like making up for everything else because none of the other wines that you're going to taste or have tasted or will taste um, have any oak influence. And uh, the reason why this actually has a lot of barrel influence is that when the winemaker, um, Eric Mori, uh, first made a Viognier, he was making it on a trial basis in such a small amount that he just put everything he had in a, in a, in a classic, you know, a burgundy sized barrel and that was what he that's what he made and the combination of the viognier the new oak he thought actually was delicious and then decided to continue uh, that winemaking technique with the viognier from f forevermore um, it's a generous style of white um, it was the, vi the viognier vineyard was planted in 2004 it's a completely organic estate a tiny production. Eric used to supply the local co-op, so he'd actually planted the vineyard back in 1988. And um, it was his dream, really, always to make his own wine. And um, he'd sold his motorbike and then borrowed some money from the I Credit Agricole or whatever to start the domain and gradually um, moved on to building his own winery, which he, he basically constructed himself, finishing it in 2007, having worked every weekend over the years. And it's an amazing project. Everything's done by hand. And I only found out about it because I found the wine, thought it was fantastic, uh, thought it was a great expression of Viognier, barrel-fermented Viognier, if you think of the great wines of Condria uh, or Chateau Grier. Um, go for you know 20, 30, you know 60 quid plus or more. Um, I looked up the wine. It's 10 to 15 pounds UK price point for a really hedonistic style of white wine. And then I found out the story of this little producer, and it's called Esperance. It's very moving because he's hoping for recognition for his winemaking and his domain. Um, and I think um, I'm hoping to give it to him. I think it's a fantastic wine. Um, I don't expect everyone to agree. Um, but that's, you know, the joys of making something that has a lot of personality. It will always be divisive. Okay, uh, that's the whites done with. Wine number five. Um, this, again, I tasted a few rosés, not millions of rosés. When I did that big sampling, I talked about 300 wines. Um, about 100 of them were white. Um, and maybe about 30 of them were rosé, so not the most enormous snapshot, which did slightly limit me. Um, but I found some lovely examples, which is what I expect to find. And here was one that I didn't choose them on the basis of colour, but we do know that the market at the moment is really demanding one thing, um, led by the success of Provence, and that is uh, really pale salmon pink rosés that are also bone dry. And uh, this is pale, salmon pink, and bone dry. Um, it's not made, though, with, with the traditional Provençal grapes that I mentioned earlier of Carignan, uh, um, of, of Grenache. Uh, Carignan is in there, but uh, Sanso and Syrah and, and Vermentino or Roll. This is, in fact, made rather unusually uh, with those Atlantic Bordeaux grapes, Merlot and Cabernet, and then Pinot Noir, which does make very good rosé. They, they, all these grapes are fantastic for rosé, but it's a slightly unusual, wacky blend, but I think that's all the more exciting. And uh, to me, when I tasted it, actually, I thought it was very much like a Provençal rosé, not just in terms of appearance, um, but in terms of character. Um, anyway, let's taste it now. Mm. So yeah, it's delicate. It's dry, um, it's very fresh, it's got some sort of slightly peachy richness to it, a little bit of red fruit, not a lot, it's certainly not sort of jammy style rosé. And then this kind of grapefruit zest, um, 
dry, slightly kind of chalky finish. Um, almost a little bit of spice in there. I, I think it's very appealing. I think it's very attractive. Uh, I think the packaging is great. Um, and I think the other thing is it's from this, uh, Famille Fabra is actually a producer, organic only, that makes wines from across uh, uh, the Languedoc, has different estates. This estate owned by them is called the Grand Courtard, basically meaning kind of big sunny courtyard. And uh, that's the producer behind L'Instant Rosé. Um, and I think to be able to find something that is clean, that's fresh, that's bright, that's beautifully packaged and organic, that retails below a tenner, is really very exciting and unusual. Um, so I think that's really as much as I, I want to say about this wine, um, because I think that's all that needs to be said. Um, but it is from, a, from a, an interesting and very good, respected producer that's part of a, a, a very small selection of, of family-owned domains uh, that are all organic. Okay, now on to the reds. We've got three wines left. And uh, this from Santa Marie de Croze, uh, the Rebellion Pinot Noir. Um, being able to find, I have to say, an inexpensive juicy, fruity Pinot Noir that's also organic really is um, a rarity. In fact, I can't think of anything really to compete with this. I mean, you have the, the very good, inexpensive uh, Chilean Pinot Noirs now under the Connoisseur label, and they've just added in an organic variant. But other than that, there would be few uh, good, juicy, well-made, organic Pinot Noirs uh, of around this price that I can think of. Um, it's uh, it's called Rebellion um, because the producer is from Corbière and that's not an, an appellation that would allow you to bottle a red wine made with Pinot Noir uh, but it's also um, from the website a kind of rebellion with its uh, big loud label um, because it's standing up um, or standing up against the idea that in France because of the Loire Evin you can't advertise any alcohol in France. So it's kind of rebelling against that by being as kind of loud as possible on the label and also using this grape variety that isn't allowed within its source region of Corbière. Um, let's have a look at it. Mm. One thing I like, the color, it's a lovely light pale ruby which is absolutely fitting for the style of wine it is. It's unoaked, it's fruity, it's delicate, it's ripe, but it's not jammy. So I think Pinot, inexpensive Pinot can often fall into two camps when it, when it goes wrong, essentially. Uh, either it can be too sweet, too jammy um, from, you know, very warm climate, late harvest Pinot, and, and quite often uh, a style that might be blended with other grapes. Uh, to pad it out a bit, um, uh, or um, inexpensive Pinot from maybe cooler climates and to hit those price points, high yielding vineyards, and that can produce a very uh, a type of Pinot that's too light, often thin, and can be a little bit green and stalky. This isn't jammy and it's not green and stalky, so I think it's really very good. Um, it is quite a light body style of wine, it is quite simple. Um, I think it's it's made with sort of semi-carbonic manner, so it has some of those slightly sort of fruity, almost like strawberry bubblegum notes initially on the nose like you might find in Beaujolais. But the palate, I think there's a nice structure despite the lack of um, oak influence or oak sourced tannins. Um, it's fresh, it's easy, uh, it's very pretty. I'm, I'm really very impressed and if you love Pinot Noir and you're looking for something on a budget, uh, it's a really good option and the fact that it's organic is a further bonus. Um, so I hope you agree to me that this is a, this is a really uh, good package uh, in a category that's fashionable at the moment, um, but actually beset from tasting with quite a few disappointments, um, usually at this lower end of the price scale. Wine 7, sorry, a bit slow. Domaine Le Nouveau Monde, and this is Caraben wine. And this was another, as again, you know, I didn't know what grape varieties I was tasting when I was tasting blind, uh, but I thought this was a really lovely, fruity, juicy wine. And it shows, I think, the, uh, the strengths of, um, of Syrah in, in the Languedoc. It's able to produce a type of wine with a lot of colour, 
a lot of fruit, a lot of structure and a lot of quality at low prices. So let's have a look and see whether this wine delivers on those fronts. Mm. As soon as that wine passed under my nose, despite the fact that I was sneezing earlier, um, I just had that instant whack of um, lovely kind of green pepper, spice, olives and blackcurrant fruit that you get with really lovely um, well-made Syrah, the sort of Syrah that isn't too ripe. It's not too sort of green olivey either. The olives are ripe in there, but it has got the character, some of the characters of, of kind of, I suppose, Syrah from the Northern Rhone, despite it coming from this southerly location. And to me, it is very clearly identifiably Syrah. It's also very pure in its fruit expression. There's no oak influence here. There's no overlay of kind of chocolate, mocha, vanilla. Uh, it's just a lovely, really fruity wine that uh, displays the hallmarks of Syrah um, in this part of the world. Um, so yeah, it's quite ripe in style. It is from uh, quite a, a hot part of, of the Languedoc, um, near Bézier. Um, the vines are in fact, uh, according to the site, um, planted just 800 meters from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and it's a very hot, sandy site. But it's moderated by the winds being so close to the sea. And in fact, uh, uh, I was reading somewhere when I was looking up about this wine that they've had to plant a windbreak of, uh, of salt tolerant reeds um, just to kind of shield the vines from the constant buffeting of sea breezes. So a hot sandy site near the Med, um, but with all the wind, it uh, it's moderates the, uh, the ripening of the grapes and also provides a site that's ideal for organic viticulture. And, uh, and a lovely wine, doesn't taste cooked or baked in any way to me. Very pure expression of sour fruit. Um, and again, inexpensive, uh, sub 10 pounds UK retail. Good, and I mean, you know, if you were looking at a, even, you know, a good wine from Saint-Joseph, as I think I was saying last week, you'd be looking at, at well over 20 pounds. Um, our final wine. So back to Domaine Gaida. Um, as I was saying earlier, I tried not to focus too much on any one producer, but it just happened that a wine that I thought was really lovely in whites uh, was from Domaine Gaida that was organic. And then there was a really lovely expression in reds that was also from the same producer that was also organic, that was also, I should stress, very affordable. Um, and it happens to be under this same brand, which as I said is, is called Flying Solo because it's kind of flying in the face of convention. And here, what's unconventional is the fact that uh, the grape is again not made with internationally international varieties, just must hit back on that, um, which are so prevalent in the Paydoc, but it's made with the traditional grapes of this part of southern France, which are Grenache and Syrah. And what I like about this wine is, uh, is that it really draws attention to what a good combination this is. Grenache and Syrah, a 60-40 blend, um, and, uh, and let's look at it. Mm. I think what you've got there is you've got something that's not too rich, not too overdone, not too jammy, but it's got ripe sweet fruit uh, and it's really pure. It doesn't need the overlay or the sweetness uh, from, from new oak or oak chips or any other winemaking uh, ingredients. Um, it just is a, just a really lovely expression of these two grape varieties and they're so complementary. You know, the Grenache tends to be a bit lighter in body but a bit sweeter in fruit profile. And then the Syrah brings a bit more structure, a bit more depth and a bit more colour. Um, and if you think actually that, um, I think it's the, the oldest appellation within the Languedoc is, uh, is an area like Fitu, uh, which is, you know, based around Grenache Syrah blends, often with a bit of more Verdre as well and Carignan, um, and was such a success in supermarkets in the UK in the 90s and it's sort of largely disappeared from the shelves. And here you have its kind of reenactments uh, with this fun label, uh, dual varietal, 
um, championing what a great combination these two grapes are um, in this part of France. So while we have looked at a Pinot Noir and seen how it performs under the, uh, the southern French sun, um, I really think these two grapes for nine quid produce a kind of style of, of juicy, fruity red wine um, that so well suits this part of France um, and such a great glass for around this price point anyway, a really sort of perfect, uh, perfect house wine for a bistro. I think we just kind of now need a, a slice of pizza uh, with a few fresh olives and some pepperoni um, and I'd be, I'd be certainly very happy. So I hope you liked the selection. Um, I hope you felt that they were good representations of their type. Um, I hope you felt that they were a good advert for organic viticulture. And I hope that you felt that these wines were also a very good uh, indication of the quality of wine for the price that you can get with the pay doc. Um, and just really kind of summing up having tasted the wines, having given you a bit of an introduction to the region, um, it's important to say that, you know, the pay doc doesn't run in conflict with the wines of the Languedoc Roussillon, where their greater strictures and the wines are, are sold by region. Um, it's complementary to those types of wines. What it does is it gives winemakers a chance to play with different grape varieties, to have a bit more freedom, and then to sell things very much with the market in mind. So it's an appellation, it's, sorry, it's a, it's a classification for a bit more creativity. Um, and then here, what we've seen is something creative that's also organic. So in summation uh, or conclusion, what I would say about the pay doc is that it's really an exciting part of France because it's big, it's diverse, it's historic, there's value for money, and it's a fantastic source for affordable organic wines. With that said, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and do please keep these wines, try them over the course of the evening, uh, maybe try that barrel fermented Viognier, over dinner, um, sit the wines, uh, see how they evolve, um, revisit them with food. Um, but for now, um, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please, I'd be very happy to take them. Um, you're also very welcome to email me if you have any further queries that you don't want to dealt with publicly at patrick at thedrinksbusiness.com. Um, alternatively, if you feel an hour is more than enough of listening to me, then please, um, I won't be offended if you choose to log off. Right, um, thank you for staying with me. I was just being told some of the questions. There are a range there. Some of them are quite specific. Um, I think maybe there are three that stick in my mind, but one of them um, particularly about the fact that the pay doc is so diverse, it's so big. Um, is it kind of in a way, does that, is that a hindrance to the marketing of the region? I don't think so. I think the pay doc as a generic regional brand is quite evocative and quite memorable. The pay doc being a shortening of the pay d'Occitane, Occitane being the name of this region of France, um, I think it's quite memorable, but I think the pay doc is associated, I would hope, certainly, in the, in the informed consumer's eyes um, with um, a style of, of wine that is quite affordable, that is a good uh, guarantee of quality um, and is, is, is very uh, typically uh, warm climate French style of wine. Um, I don't think it's associated with any particular grape variety. I don't think the region is trying to pigeonhole itself. I think obviously there is a simplicity if the pay doc was just known for one type of wine from one grape variety. But I don't think um, the diversity within the pay doc uh, would prevent it being successful. But I take the point that it is certainly quite a complex region, but I think it's building its image around the fact that it offers um, a lot of creativity, a lot of range, and particularly it is a go-to source of variety labelled wines. Um, but I take that point. Uh, I think there was a question about screw caps. I think that was interesting. I wondered whether someone would think that. I was slightly surprised when I 
um, uncorked the rosé um, that it was a, a cork because when I looked at it, it looked like it was going to be one of those glass stoppers, the vino locks that are becoming very popular for Provençal rosés. And I think actually a vinolock closure, uh, lock glass cl closure would work very well with this wine. But I think the pay dock is quite traditional as well as being modern. And um, cork closures are prevalent in this part of France. And, you know, a, a modern uh, agglomerated uh, cork closure from a good producer is, is a very safe bet and it's, it, it's, you know, it's inexpensive and it's reliable. So I don't see that as an issue, um, but I also do note that the only two screw cap closed wines are the two from Domaine Gaida, which I picked out as being very much new world in its approach with an Australian general manager and very much focused on, I think, the UK and US uh, markets. So those are the only two screw caps. I wouldn't want to get into the closures debates. I don't think it's an issue that these are these are mostly under cork. Um, and also, uh, I was asked um, varieties that were harder to grow organically. Are some harder to grow organically than others? I think there's some grapes that are more resistant to disease um, and better adapted, probably, to this part of the world. Um, I think there is uh, truth in that. Um, but I think what you're finding is that those grapes that perhaps were more susceptible to certain types of disease perform very well naturally in this dry, windswept um, region of France. So perhaps something like a grape like Pinot Noir uh, it demands a lot of, uh, a, a lot of hands-on treatment in the vineyard. Um, and it is a thin skin grape, it is susceptible to rot, but here, when transplanted to a dry, windy climate, performs very well. And actually, a lot of the key to getting expression from Pinot Noir is just keeping uh, yields low by, you know, hard winter pruning, pruning um, so, and, and circulation in the, in, in the vines. But, you know, those grapes that are susceptible to rot and disease would perform very well here, like, uh, like Pinot Noir. But, you know, a grape uh, variety that's really in the ascendancy in this part of France, France is Carignan. And that really is a, a tough brute of a variety. Um, and I think really what we're looking at is not so much disease resistance, but drought resistance. Um, and grapes like Carignan and, and Grenache are very good in areas where there's little water because um, these vineyards for the most part will be, won't be irrigated. Um, I hope that's dealing with the main questions that I received just now. Um, if there's anything more and you feel that uh, things haven't been answered, um, then please email me. I think there was one other question about UK representation for these wines. Uh, some of them do have importers in the UK, um, but my f uh, the way I selected them, as I said at the outset, was were they good? Were they good representations of their type? And then for this masterclass, were they organic? It wasn't, do they have a UK importer? Are they retailed in the UK? And actually it was quite exciting to find wines that fit the criteria I just mentioned that weren't already imported in the UK because these masterclasses are designed for the trade. And I think it's quite fun for buyers to be able to find something that's completely new and therefore potentially carve out a new market. Um, obviously it does require more work and it is more complex. Um, but they're easy to find information about online and check if they're importers. And if you actually do need an importer list for the wines, these masterclasses, please drop us a line because I know we'll have it and we can provide it. I just haven't included it in the PowerPoint. So with that said, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, there is a third and final masterclass next Monday when I'll be looking at the more innovative wines from the pay dock. Uh, it, that involve unusual um, grapes and blends, but also native grape varieties uh, from historic vines and vineyards. Uh, so the things that are a bit more esoteric from the pay dock, just to complete the picture of what this region is able to provide from the commercial and varietal to the organic, and then the more esoteric and native. Um, thank you very much again. 
and have a good evening and do please enjoy the samples.